Actually, it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Peter Shellen, and to tell us something about homology and volume of hyperbolic three manifolds or three orbifolds, actually, and enumeration of arithmetic groups. Thank you. The Tom Lehrer reference there for. Uh, okay, so um, I thought I would begin at the beginning. Uh, talk about, uh, say a word about number fields. Of course, a, a number field is just a, a finite uh, a field extension of the rational numbers. So uh, a, a nice example is uh, Q adjoins square root of minus 1. And uh, if um, if k is a number field, uh, a useful thing to study from the point of view of number theory is, uh, is, is the ring of integers, uh, let's say a, ring of integers. These are just elements that um, satisfy, well, they're the roots of, more correctly, a, a monic a polynomial with, with integer coefficients. So uh, in this example, it turns out that the ring of integers is z adjoined square root of minus 1. So this is just things of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. And uh, the uh, applications of this kind of thing in number theory go Go, go way back. These are called the Gaussian integers. And uh, I, I believe Gauss understood that you could prove a, fair, a famous theorem of uh, Fermat using these, which says that a, um, uh, it's, it's just a theorem about ordinary integers. It says, well, to look at a nice special case, if you take a prime in z is a sum of two squares. Uh, let's say p is your prime. It's a sum of two squares if and only if p is congruent to 1 mod 4. So uh, in fact, it turns out that this is essentially a consequence of, of a version of unique factorization. In this ring of Gaussian integers, And the, the, re the, reason, the reason basically is that if p is, a, if p is a sum of two squares, that gives you a way of factoring it in this ring. Namely, it's a plus, a plus, uh, a plus bi times a minus bi. And in fact, you can use this to show that it has a non-trivial factorization. I'll say in a second what non-trivial means. Uh, if, if and only if um, it's a sum of two squares. And that's, that's the key. To, and, and then, the, uh, as I say, this unique factorization can then be used to, to, to prove this. Um, uh, so so I, say, I say essentially unique, uh, or uh, I said a non-trivial uh, uh, factorization. And what non-trivial means is that both the factors are non-units. So uh, of course, if you're just talking about positive integers, unique factorization is, is really unique factorization. The moment you talk about arbitrary integers and you want to do unique factorization into primes, you have to bring in minus 1, which is the unit. So anytime you want to even state what unique factorization means, it's sort of unique up to varying the factors by multiplying them by units. And so the, the, the group of units in a number field is always, uh, or more precisely, in the ring of integers is always a basic thing to, to look at. So, so, so we, have, uh, we have number fields. We have the integers in number fields. And then the, the group of units in the integers, which is always a, a basic thing. So these are, these are the things that, that, that just you know, they want to understand if you're looking at a number field, and in particular, if you're trying to get number theoretic information out of it. Um, now. Uh, so I mentioned Fermat's theorem. There's another uh, famous, uh, I guess, 18th century, 18th century theorem, so later than Fermat, du, du de Lagrange. 
and uh, he proved the famous and wonderful result that uh, every, every non-negative integer is a sum of four squares. And uh, it turns out that this can also be proved in very much the same spirit as, uh, as Fermat's theorem. Of course, when you're looking at four squares uh, factorization in, uh, you know, in, in, with just uh, complex numbers like this uh, doesn't, doesn't really tell you what you want to do. If you want to look at four things, you need to talk about quaternions. And so uh, it turns out that there is a, a proof of uh, Lagrange's theorem, which is very much in the same spirit as, as, as this proof of, uh, of Fermat's theorem, but it, I, I think it's due to Hurwitz, and it's, it, it involves the, uh, the Hurwitz uh, integer quaternions. So, um, so you can just look at um, you, you, you can look at, uh, let's say, um, uh, B, I guess I would call it, uh, which would be the, uh, uh, let's say it's all the, uh, the quaternions with uh, rational coefficients. So, so these are Hamiltonian quaternions of the form A plus BI plus cj plus dk, where uh, a, b, c, and d are, are rational. And inside that, one has an analog of, well, let's say of the Gaussian integers or of the integers in a, in a number field. So the, uh, uh, the Hurwitz quaternions, I probably want to call them uh, O for the purpose of this talk. Uh, are the set of things of the form a plus bi plus cj plus dk such that, well, the definition is a little tricky, a, b, c, and d are all, well, they're either all integers Or they're all half integers. So half integer means something that, that's not an integer. It's a half plus an integer. And you can check that they're a subring. So they're behaving like the integers in a number field. But of course, we're in a non-commutative situation here. And uh, uh, it, it turns out, again, there is a version. of unique factorization in O, that gives, that gives Lagrange's theorem. So, well, so it's clear that there should be non-commutative things that are like number fields and have an analog of the uh, ring of integers and the units in the ring of integers, uh, which are useful for doing number theory. And the relevant concept here is that of a quaternion algebra over a field. So let's say k is a field of characteristic 0, for example. It's more general than that, but let's stick with that. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's an associative algebra over k, which as a vector space over k has dimension 4. And in fact, it has a linear, a linear basis uh, 1, which is the identity i, j, and k, um, such that, uh, uh, let me make sure I get this right now. Uh, i squared equals alpha j squared equals beta, and ij equals k, and ji equals minus k, where uh, 
alpha and beta are, are two non-zero elements of the field. So they, of course, determine this thing up to isomorphism, although the, there can be different choices that could give you the same, that could give you isomorphic algebras. So alpha and beta are uh, non-zero elements of the field. Yeah, so, the, so over R, it turns out that the only examples of these things are the Hamiltonian quaternions and, well, it turns out the, 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 the ring of matrices over R, uh, the, ring of, the ring of all two by two matrices over R is, is also an example. And in fact, uh, it's a general fact that any, any quaternion algebra is either a division, a, um, a division algebra like the Hamiltonian quaternions, so every non-zero element is invertible, uh, or it's isomorphic to uh, to the two by two matrices over K. And in the algebraically closed case, this is what always happens. As I said, in the real case, of course, um, it it happens about half the time. So. Okay, so, um, well, in, in this example, we saw that, so, so of course, uh, these rational quaternions are an example of a quaternion algebra over a number field, namely Q. And uh, as we saw, we, in, this, in this application, we not only wanted the field, we wanted some kind of version of a ring of integers. So the relevant uh, generalization here is the notion of a maximal order, so an order in, uh, in an algebra B over K. It doesn't have to, have to be a, a um, quaternion algebra. Uh, that, that just means it's a, uh, it's a subring which additively, so just in terms of its structure as, a, as an additive group, uh, is a free abelian on some basis. For uh, for uh, for B. Okay, so the uh, so it's easy to see that the um, uh, Her Hurwitz. Uh, so in in the quaternion algebra consisting of the quaternions with rational coefficients, uh, the uh, the uh, the Hurwitz the Hurwitz criterions are are the, the Hurwitz uh, quat quaternions um, are in order. In fact, they're a maximal order with respect to inclusion. Uh, in a number field, uh, the, the ring of integers is the unique maximal order. In general, for a quaternion algebra over a number field, there may be more than one. And so, Basically, one wants to, just as it's interesting to study number fields, it's interesting to study, as I hope I've illustrated, uh, quaternion algebras over, over number fields. And, and uh, then one wants to know about their, their maximal orders for the same reason that one wants to know about uh, integers in a number field. And, and one wants to know about the group of units in the maximal order. So that's basically the object that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so, 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 so let's say now B is a quaternion algebra over, let's say, K, which is a number field. Uh, so, so, uh, oh, so let's say O is a maximal order. They're not unique in general, so things are already more complicated here than they are in the number field case. But O is a maximal order. The Hurwitz uh, integers would be an e integer quaternions would be an example. And um, oh, it, it turns out that K. These are, this is a central. These things turn out to be central simple algebras, which means in particular that K is the center of B. K star is the center of the multiplicative group um, 
uh, B star, oh, and I guess, I guess this should be a division quaternion algebra, not, not, not one of the stupid kinds that are just the, that are just the, uh, the, the ring of matrices. Um, so, uh, so, 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 you know, basically, if you really want to focus on the information that's pertinent to the quaternion algebra itself instead of just the field, you want to, instead of looking at B star, you want to divide out by, by K star. So the, the basic object that I'm really going to be talking about is going to be the image of O star. So this is the, uh, of course, this just means the group of units in O under the natural map in, into uh, B star mod K star. So you can take that as, so these are examples of, uh, of what are called arithmetic groups. Such a thing as, an in fact, it includes all the examples that I'll be interested in today. But um, so it, it looks like a very algebraic thing, and of course, uh, uh, of course, what I, the reason I'm here is that I want to apply uh, topology and geometry to to the study of these things. So, uh, so I want to say something about how one can actually uh, think about these things um, geometrically. And uh, one, one does this in terms of by using uh, places. So uh, if you have a real, if you have a number field, uh, turns out it's useful in general to look at real and complex places. So a real place of K is just a homomorphism, a, a field homomorphism, necessarily injective, from K into R. And a complex place. Well, a complex place, um, it's, actually a, uh, it's actually a complex conjugate pair of homomorphisms from K into R, such that, uh, K into C rather, such that the image is not contained in R. Okay. And uh, you know, it's it's a base. There are various basic facts about this in number theory. The there are only finitely many places. And if you take the number of real places plus twice the number of com uh, complex uh, places, you get the degree of the field as an extension of Q, and uh, and stuff like that. But. Um, but the, uh, uh, so, 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 so the point is that when you have, uh, if you have a real place, it gives, uh, uh, an embedding, an injective homomorphism of uh, B star mod K star. So if you take a real place of K and you're given a quaternion algebra, uh, it, gives you, it gives you an embedding of this into, uh, well, um, uh, so, so let's see. So it's going to give you, it's, it's, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you a, sorry. If you have a real place, what I should have said is it identifies K with a subgroup of R, a, sub, a subfield of R. So therefore, a B tensor R over K is defined, and it's, a, it's automatically, very formally, you see that it's still a quaternion algebra over R, 
So therefore, it's isomorphic either to M2 of R. In this case, one, uh, one says that, the, uh, that uh, B does not ramify. Over, uh, over the place, or that the place is not ramified at B, I guess, um, or, um, or, or else it's the Hamiltonian quaternions, H, okay? Not to be confused with the other H. So, so, so this gives an embedding. Of uh, so, so this now actually gives an embedding. Well, you take x goes to x tensor one. That's an embedding of b, of b into this. So it gives an embedding of b in uh, M two R or or H, depending on whether it does not or does ramify. And therefore, you get an embedding of passing to these quotients of b star mod k star into, well, you take the units of this, which would be GL2R divided by the center, so that's PGL2R. And likewise, in the, in the ramified case, you get, uh, I guess it's PS, PSU2. Uh, in the complex case, you don't have you don't have two possibilities. There there is no there is no um, division quaternion algebra over a over an algebraically closed field. There's only the matrix algebra. So a complex case a complex place uh, gives an embedding of B star mod K star into uh, PGL2C. Uh, well, there, there are finitely many of them, so you can, you can do a diagonal construction. So if, if there are, if there are A, if A is the number of, uh, uh, I guess it's um, unramified real embeddings, real places, on you know unramified at uh, or places at which B does not ramify. So for B, and if uh, if B is the number of complex places of k then you can use, then you get a diagonal embedding of uh, of b star mod k star into a copy a, a product of a copies of uh, pgl2 r and uh, B copies of PGL2C. And it turns out that the, now of course we also have the map of, of O star into this. The image of O star in this, uh, in this lead group is, um, is, is a lattice. That means it's discrete. And that the quotient and that the covolume is uh, is finite. So that that means that this group O star can be identified with a lattice. Uh, o star is then isomorphic to in, in a canonical way now to a lattice, uh, which I'm going to call delta sub O. In, uh, in B star mod K star. Now, I, le I left out one important point when I talked about, uh, about, these, uh, about these groups of the type O star, which is that the, uh, they, they don't 
O star does not behave as nicely, again, as the units in, a, in the ring of integers of a number field would. The ring of integers in a number field, so I have to come back to this because I neglected to say it, uh, uh, the ring of integers in a number field, so let's say uh, A is the integers in a number field, the uh, units of A, A star, is, is maximal in its uh, commensurability class. That means it doesn't have finite index in any strictly uh, bigger, bigger subgroup of the multiplicative group of a field. So remember two, so remember two, two subgroups, uh, let's say x and y of a group are commensurable, I guess in the strong sense, narrow sense, uh, if, uh, if their intersection has finite index in both of them. Well, the analog of this breaks down if you're looking at a maximal order for a quaternion algebra. So therefore, number theoretically, uh, the more natural thing, more natural than studying uh, O star is to study uh, subgroups of B star that are commensurable with O star. And so of course, uh, so, um, so subgroups of B star mod K star that are commensurable with O star, uh, uh, sorry, O star uh, with, with the image of O star, I should say, uh, also have a right to be called arithmetic. And in fact, they're often more interesting than the image of the group of units itself. So therefore, groups, uh, so subgroups of PGL to R to the A cross PGL to C to the B uh, commensurate with delta O are, are also considered arithmetic. Uh, so, so let me let me mention two especially interesting examples. It'll be important later. One is the group that I'll call gamma sub O, following Borel, which is the the normalizer, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, of delta sub O. And that does turn out to contain it with, with finite index. And another one is gamma O1, which is the subgroup, well, it's the image. This one's actually contained in delta O, so it's the image of the subgroup uh, of O star consisting of, unit, of units with reduced norm 1. I'll say what that means. Okay, so if, uh, if x is an element of b, then x tensor 1, if we, if we tensor b uh, with, with its algebraic closure, or you could think of the complex numbers, I guess it doesn't really matter, 
but well, we, if we don't have a, if we don't specify a place, I should just take the, I should just take the algebraic closure. So k bar means the algebraic closure of k, um, because it's algebraically closed. This is actually isomorphic to uh, m2 of uh, of k bar, so so we can identify this with a matrix, and the determinant of this under this identification, this is called the reduced norm of x. Okay, so again, it turns out that that this is commensurable, and uh, these are examples of of, of lattices. Now. Uh, me being me, of course, my favorite case is the case when uh, b equals uh, 1 and a equals 0. That means that, uh, that, means that k has uh, exactly one complex place. And that B ramifies at all real places. And in that case, what we're look these lattices that we're looking at are lattices in in PGL to uh, C. And uh, so, if if they were uh, this is the uh, group of uh, isometries of hyperbolic three space. So if these were torsion-free, then they, we could pass to the quotient and define hyperbolic manifolds. But uh, typically, these things have torsion, so it's necessary to think about hyperbolic, hyperbolic orbifolds. Um, so, so, so any invariant of this uh, hyperbolic orbifold, for example, its volume, now actually becomes an invariant of the uh, arithmetic group, and it's a Theorem due to Borel that uh, there are, I won't try to state it in the most general form, but there are only finitely many uh, arithmetic lattices, for example, in for example, in PGL two C. With a given, uh, with, with volume less than a given, say less than or equal to a given uh, non-negative, uh, say positive real number v. Okay, uh, and the, uh, this is still number theory because it's an analog of a uh, theorem that uh, a well-known theorem about number fields that there are only finitely many number fields with, uh, if I have it right, with at most a given discriminant. And um, so the, the, the volume turns out to, up sorry? To right? uh, yes, yes, up to conjugacy. Right. Yeah. right. But I, I guess if you think in terms of the quaternion algebra, it's, you have a more canonical object there. It's only when you put it inside PGL2C that, it's, that there's a conjugacy issue, but that's right. Well, I guess that's not right. You could, you could do conjugacy back in, back in the quaternion algebra, too. Right. It's, it's, uh, up to, it would be up to isomorphism, up to conjugacy. That's right. Um, so, so even though even though this is an analog of, uh, of a theorem in uh, number theory, uh, Borel's original proof actually uh, used some geometry, as I'll explain in just a moment. And there was a purely number theoretic proof that was given later by um, uh, Chinberg and, and Friedman. But I, but I want to say a few words about, about his approach, which will include that key step which he had to do uh, geometrically. Uh, because it's uh, it's going to motivate um, what I'm trying to talk about today if I, if I ever get up to it. Um, so uh, uh, let, let's see. So uh, 
So, so th the basic point is this. So Borel uh, used a, a volume formula, a, a, let's say a formula for Uh, for lattices, the correct term here would be covolume. Of course, the volume would be for the quotient orbital. Okay, uh, formula for the covolume uh, which is which he did prove really purely number theoretically, uh, but in the case of of a lattice, well, of one of those two types that I mentioned, lattice of the form. Uh, uh, gamma O1. Uh, he also observed that to prove finiteness, or for that matter, to or to enumerate the to, to make an actual list. Of the arithmetic lattices with covolume at most v, uh, that it's actually enough. It's enough to do it. Well, unfortunately, not for gamma O1, but for uh, for gamma O, which remember was that bigger thing. It was the normalizer of something. So it's, a, it's, a, it's enough to do it for, uh, for lattices of the form gamma sub, gamma sub O. So there, there's a gap here. And, and it turns out, well, it, it turns out, as I said, this is, it follows easily from the definitions that this is a subgroup of this. It turns, well, they're both commensurate, as I said, so it's a subgroup of finite index. But not only that, it turns out that the quotient gamma O mod gamma O1 is an elementary abelian two group. So that just means it's a direct product of groups of order two. So you can think of it as a vector space over Z mod two. So if, if, if you denote by R the rank of this, say the dimension as a vector space, or the number of factors in the product, then of course the index is 2 to the R. So, so the index of gamma O1 and gamma O is 2 to the R. Which means that the oops, that the covolume of uh, of gamma of gamma O, which is uh, well of gamma, yeah, the the, co the covolume of gamma O one, which is the thing we really know how to deal with number theoretically, is equal to two to the r times the covolume of uh, of gamma O. So that means that if, uh, if um, yeah, so that means that if you knew that this was at most V, then this would be at most 2 to the R times, times V. And so to understand groups of, of this type with covolume at most V, you'd have to understand groups of this type with covolume at most this. Now you can understand groups of this type using his formula for things of most given volume, but in order to have a bound on the volume, you need a bound on R. So the key point is that to make this sort of thing work and to make an actual list of arithmetic uh, lattices with the most given covolume, you need a, you need a way of bounding uh, R in terms of the volume. Now it's known that you can do that. I think you, you even have a, a linear bound. Uh, so well, so, uh, so there's an obvious topological way of bounding R above. Uh, 
uh, because uh, after all, this, this group, this quotient group, is in particular a quotient group of, uh, of gamma O. So it's bounded above by the uh, R is bounded above by the dimension of H1 of O with Z2 coefficients. So I'm being a topologist here. This means the integer is mod 2. And, um, and, and so, well, uh, I, I think it was certainly known to, I believe it's Jorgensen who first did things like this. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, there, there is a linear bound on the, even the uh, rank of the fundamental group. So in particular, the rank of this homology in terms of Uh, in, term, in terms of the volume of M for hyperbolic, well, manifold, or I guess it works the same way for an orbifold. All right. Um, uh, the trouble is that the known bounds that you get in general are astronomical, so they would be of no use for calculation. And um, and uh, I, I mean, Chinberg and Friedman's number theoretic bound was a little bit better, but not enough to get them, not enough to be able to deal with anything but the smallest interesting values of V, which are ju just above the volume of the smallest uh, hyperbolic orbifold. Uh, so, so, so now the problem that I've been leading up to the whole time, uh, I've been telling you why I'm interested in it, I guess, is to uh, find uh, good bounds for uh, the dimension of H1 of O with mod, with mod 2 coefficients uh, uh, in terms of a given bound for for the volume, or, well, um, yeah, let, me, let me say omega here. So this means an orbifold, OK? So here omega is, a, 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 well, in, in, it, the interesting case turns out to be when it's closed, uh, orientable hyperbolic three orbifold. Okay, so, so no longer necessarily arithmetic. No, no longer necessarily arithmetic. Although I mean, I do think that arithmeticity can be used here, but it's not the direction I've been going in recently, for better or for worse. I've been thinking about arbitrary hyperbolic orbifolds. Um, so, so there's a minor miracle here, which is what got me started on this, which is that. The corresponding um, problem about manifolds it was one that I had been working on for, for many years in collaboration with, with Mark Culler and other people. So, uh, so it seemed very natural to try to extend this to orbifolds. So known results for M a hyperbolic three manifold. Uh, orientable and well, you can assume without gen loss of generality. I think always that it's closed. Um, so if if the volume is at most uh, 1.22, then uh, so, yeah. So the the you know the sort of the general nonsense approach uh, based on Jorgensen's theorem would give you something in the in the millions. But in fact, we showed that the dimension of H1. This is volume of M, a dimension of H1 with mod 2 coefficients is at most, uh, uh, I think it's 3. And if the volume is at most 3.08, OK, th so this, this, was this was in a joint paper with um, Agel and Culler and myself. Uh, if the volume is at most 3.08, then, well, 
Modulo the tameness conjecture, which was later done by Egol and Caligari Gabai. This was in a paper that I wrote jointly with um, Anderson, uh, Anderson, Canary, and Color. So, uh, so in this case, the dimension is at most six. And if the volume is at most 3.44, then, then the dimension is at most seven. And uh, so, so this, as I say, was uh, Anderson, Canary, uh, Color, and myself. Uh, this was, this was Color and myself, but it's actually an improvement on on something we did with Egal. Uh, a different paper that we wrote with Egal. Uh, so so I, I should mention, I mean, these, these, are, these are very deep results. They involve the whole, all the machinery in surrounding the log 2k minus 1 theorem and uh, a lot of very interesting and deep topological arguments and also the work of um, also the work of uh, Egel, Storm, and Thurston on, on uh, volumes and incompressible surfaces, which uh, builds, on, uh, builds on the work of Perlman, among other things. So, so it, seemed, uh, it seemed like a good bet that there should be some information here about, um, about orbifolds. Um, so, uh, let, let me just tell, let me, let me begin with a general principle. This is a theorem that it turns out to be a rather simple application of, uh, of Smith theory. Uh, but I'm going to have to uh, make an awkward assumption now, and it doesn't usually hold for arithmetic groups, but I can only tell you what I know. So I'm going to assume that the uh, singular set of the orbifold is a link. And uh, sometimes I'll assume, although it's actually quite harmless for the application to arithmetic things, uh, that um, pi 1 of uh, omega uh, does not contain a triangle group. Turns out if it does, then, well, then there are all kinds of things that, that you can do to handle it, OK? So, um, so, so here's a theorem under this assumption. Um, Omega always has a two-sheeted cover, omega tilde, such that the dimension of H1 of omega with mod 2 coefficients is at most the following. So I have 1 plus the dimension of H1 of the underlying manifold of omega. So these are when the singular, well, Quite generally, when it's orientable, the underlying space is a manifold, a three manifold, uh, plus the dimension of H1 of the underlying manifold of this two sheeted cover. So that means that you will get bounds of this type for the orbifold case, uh, for the homology of the orbifold, if you know how to get bounds for the homology of the underlying manifold. Now, sometimes this gives you a very trivial uh, res uh, uh, conclusions now. So for example, if, um, if, the, uh, if it so happens that the underlying manifold is hyperbolic, then, uh, uh, th th then it's, uh, it's known that the volume of the underlying manifold is at most the volume of of omega. So then you can say, for example, for example, if the volume of omega is at most 3.44, then, uh, then in fact, um, uh, yeah, well, well, well then, then you can use uh, these, uh, you, you, you can use the results over there. Yeah, 
you know, let's, let's say it's at most 1.72. So any two-sheeted cover then has volume at most 3.44. You can use the results over here to bound the homology of the, manifold, of the orbifold and its two-sheeted cover. Oh well. Uh, or the underlying manifold and the underlying manifold of the two-sheeted cover. So then you can get, this is not, the, not even the optimal thing you can get from this argument, but I'll just write it down this way. So then the volume uh, uh, dimension of H1 of the manifold is at most, most 15. I said that because I haven't calculated the best number you can get from this argument. It's better than that. But, um, okay, but, well, so one very non-trivial fact that, I, that I've proved is that this is still true if you assume only that the underlying manifold is irreducible. And basically the reason is that if it's irreducible uh, but not hyperbolic, Either its homology is very small or else Perlman tells you, because geometrization tells you, that, um, that it has essential tori in it. Essential tori in the, or in the underlying manifold can be used to produce uh, incompressible uh, suborbifolds of the orbifold, and then you have the orbifold version of this machinery of Agel, Storm, and Thurston, which relates uh, volume to information about, uh, well, incompressible surfaces in their case, but could also be incompressible um, two orbifolds. So, this, so this, is, this is one quite deep result that I've been able to prove. Um, so I, I'm out of time. I guess I'll write down one more thing, which I absolutely know is true. Um, so so here's, here's a theorem. If, uh, if, um, If the volume of omega uh, is at most uh, 0 0.9115, uh, I think that's a quarter of 3.66 if I have it right, which is the volume of a, an ideal hyperbolic oct regular octahedron. Um, then. Uh, Uh, th then the dimension of, of H1 of omega with mod 2 coefficients is bounded by, again, I have not written down the, rest, the best bound here, but it's, it's cer certainly 30. And I think it's, it's really something better if you look at it more carefully. So I won't write down the, um, what I expect it to be my main theorem. It's true on some days and not on others, and today doesn't happen to be one of the days when it's true. But, but what it says is that if the volume is about 1.72, then you get a band of about, of about 50 here. And um, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of attached to trying to prove that because, first of all, because it uses a lot of combinatorial machinery that I've developed, although it turns out that the, the best part of that combinatorial machinery is also involved in here, but also it really it really depends on the full strength of this theorem, which which is a theorem that I that I really want to apply. So so that's that's where I am right now. Okay, thank you very much again.